17, 32, and 16. I got mad at her. I went crazy. And I pushed him out of the car outside. What makes good people with no criminal history? And I just wanted to be someone that my family could brag about. Suddenly snap. You go from this nice girl, and all of a sudden, she's some kind of monster. How can we spot red flags when there are none? Is it even possible to find the warning signs of the Transformer? As a former FBI profiler, I'm often asked, can you spot a killer? Is it a look, an attitude, a pattern of behavior? After 40 years' experience, I can say it's complicated. But there's one thing I know. There is a deadly type. feeling when you pulled that trigger? Nothing at all. Dallas, Texas, 2008. Brittany Gully is just 19 years old when suddenly and inexplicably, her life goes off the rails. Brittany embarks on a week-long shooting spree that leaves two people dead and another blind. I was pretty much just stumbling, not seeing straight, just completely just off balance. Mentally. Everything, yes. In 2013, I sat down with Brittany in the Central Texas prison to delve into what transformed a loving daughter and dedicated service woman in the U.S. Army into a rampaging killer. I lived a pretty okay life. I wasn't just a straight A student, but I was, you know, Mediocre, you know, I passed. Um, I graduated with honors. Well, that's more than mediocre. I joined the Army so I can take care of my family. I wanted my mom to retire. I wanted to be able to take care of her. And I just wanted to be someone that my family could brag about. Brittany's life turns out exactly the opposite of what she wanted. How could that happen? One obvious factor marks the beginning of Britney's downward spiral. My downfall was drugs. What kind of drugs? Um, cocaine. And little did I know it was just, that was the, the door opening to ruin in my life. A high that just makes you forget about everything, where nothing matters. Nothing matters. Yes. Except more cocaine. Yes. There were drastic changes as far as the way I was acting. I started to have more of a short fuse, actually. Shorter fuse. Yes. You were more angry. Yes. Some drugs, including alcohol, can be personality amplifiers. Happy people become happier. Angry people become more angry. I think that might have been what was going on with Brittany. She had a lot of unresolved anger. Why do you think you became a killer at the age of 19? I would have to say probably because I was hating myself. I hated myself. On the night of September 27th, 2008, these negative forces in Brittany's life converge. 
as she and her friend Jeremisha Adams head out on the town, high, angry, and armed. Oh, you're from the hood, you're gonna have some protection with you because you just never know. You know, you, you can piss someone off and they wanna get back at you. She was angry, she was drugged up, and she had a loaded shotgun. Brittany was an extremely dangerous person. But no one stepping in. There is no counter voice to the cocaine that's raging in her head. The girls encounter Pasquale Montealvo, a local man simply attending a quinceanera. They were having some type of words, and um, he kind of like blows her off. But he didn't touch her? No, he didn't touch her. And then what happened? I shot him. Did you talk to him before you pulled the trigger? No, no. So you didn't even ask him for anything? No. Were you angry? I was angry, yes, but off, not at him. It was just... What were you angry about? Just my life in general. I was a failure. Brittany's transformation from devoted daughter to cold-blooded killer is complete. But the killing has only just begun. With no link to their victim and no witnesses to the crime, Brittany and Jeremisha are feeling untouchable. A week later, they're back cruising the streets, and once again, Brittany's riding shotgun. We were driving, and a guy ran across the street. You know, we almost hit him with the car. So we pulled up on the side of him. Carnell Pardue is simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. So we're into a, a heated argument, and I go with the shotgun, and uh, I fire, fired at him. Hit him in the face? Yes. Carnell survives, but the injury to his face leave him permanently blind. And Brittany's not done. An hour later, she holds another innocent stranger at gunpoint, Jose Molina. Yeah, it was just high, and once again, I reacted. You shot him? Yes. Nineteen years old, and you've killed two people in two weeks that you didn't even know and met you no harm. Yes. Did drugs kill Brittany's victims? Some would say yes. Brittany is an angry young woman, but she still knows the consequences of her actions. When she's high, those consequences disappear. But when she comes down, those consequences are staring her in the face. I realized, oh man, I just did that. I was like, why did I do it? I have to face reality and, and realize that people, two people are dead. In 2009, Brittany Gully is convicted of two counts of murder plus aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. A total sentence of 60 years. A collision course of depression, drugs, and self-hatred turned a bright young woman with a clean record into a spree killer in the space of two weeks. Katie Kersey is another person who would never dream she could do anything evil. In fact, she did one of the cruelest things I've ever heard. Oh, 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 oh,
Katie, could it have possibly been a guardrail on a bridge that you hit? supposedly pushed out of the car? In Fort Valley, Georgia in 2013, Katie is a caregiver to Troy Johnson, who's confined to a wheelchair after a childhood accident. She was always smiling and laughing. You know, she, she would joke around with us. I mean, she was just a really nice person. Troy's cousin, Sade Owens, remembers the early days fondly. I believe that they really did love each other. She was happy, he was happy. She would, you know, make sure he took his meds, ate, brushed his teeth. You know, if he needed to change clothes, she would change his clothes. Troy's parents have passed but between his grandmother and Katie, he has the support he needs. And Katie likes to stay close to Troy, very close. As long as they were spending time together, everything was fine. But the minute he would go off with another one of his friends, there's an argument. Katie is the loving caregiver, but only on her terms. That's a warning sign. I would go so far as to say, perhaps that was the reason Katie was attracted to Troy in the first place. His profound disability left her in control. She always wanted him to be where she could find him. If he wasn't home, that's when she would argue. Katie's occasional use of methamphetamine puts a further strain on the relationship. Eventually, they drift apart, but remain friends and stay in regular contact. On March 14, 2017, they arrange a trip to the local shopping mall. They were supposed to be going to the store. His chair was outside. It was left in the yard. After they leave, Troy realizes Katie is high on meth. When he demands to go back home, she refuses. Troy never used those drugs, so I don't think he knew what she was going through or the drugs she was using. At the mall, when Katie leaves Troy alone in the car, he resorts to calling 911. Hello? I'm out of my wheel. Girl, I'm in a wheelchair, and then she's trying to take me where I don't want to go. What's the girl's name? Do you know? Her name is Katie. Troy was telling the police he didn't feel safe. He was out of his element. He did have his wheelchair, and he wanted to go home. OK, she's still in the store? Yeah, she's still in the store. Now that she's coming out, though. OK, well, I've got, I've got people in route, OK? Despite the influence of the drugs in her system, Katie was able to pull herself together enough to look the cop right in the eye and say, oh, there's no problem, officer. I'll take him home. Then when she gets behind the wheel, she drives the opposite direction from Troy's home, drives through a fence, deep into the woods. If Katie was crazy at that time, she was crazy like a fox. She knew what she was doing. Katie Corsi has transformed from loving caregiver to a drug-fueled monster, and wheelchair-bound Troy Johnson is at her mercy. That's when she took his phone in the midst of having this heated argument going down this wooded area. She just pushed him or put him out of the car. It's a private road with no passing traffic and not a house in sight. 
Katie abandons Troy without his wheelchair, without his phone, and left him there to die. While she went on a bender for three days. I've never been on drugs before, so I don't know what it feels like or what could have been going through her mind. It's only when Katie turns up at a relative's home that they call the police. Nobody's seen the boy since he got in the car with her. Well, now she's saying something about they hit a fence and she kicked him out of the truck because he was fussing at her. I got mad at her. I, I, I went crazy. And I pushed him out of the car outside. As the temperature plummets into the low 20s, it's a race against time to work out Troy's location. I mean, she's the only person who knows where this boy is, as far as I know. I just knew that we got to get him some help if he's out there. It's been so cold. Katie's relative tries desperately to jog her memories of that last fateful drive. I'm now going toward the trash dump, where the trash place is. Grace Chapel. Yes, Grace Chapel. OK, all right, well, we're riding on down that way, baby. Look, we just went. But Katie's mind is still so addled by drugs, she can't even tell them where to look. You don't know, baby? No, when you keep talking, I don't. Katie, you really don't have a clue where you where you got got him out of the vehicle, do you? That's fine, go ahead. But I mean, the longer he sits out there, the worse shape he's gonna be in. Helpless and alone, with no hope of rescue, Troy dies of hypothermia. You try not to think about the way it happened and the way she did, because that, it hurts more. It hurts a whole lot more. After three days on March 17, 2017, the police find Troy's body at an isolated hunting camp. To know that Katie hurt him after she was the one that loved him so much. That was the most hurtful thing to me. And then a couple of days later, I did find out that she had gotten back on drugs. And of course, you know, we knew then that that was the issue. Katie Corsi is diagnosed with drug-induced psychosis and admitted to a psychiatric facility. In 2017, she is convicted of murder and neglect of a disabled adult and sentenced to life in prison. Katie showed a possessiveness and controlling nature in her relationship with Troy. I believe Katie would never have committed murder if she hadn't been on drugs. But Tanya Bellamy is under the influence of another power altogether. She wanted to fit in with her crowd. Tanya Bellamy was 19. She had a future. She wanted to be a social worker, and she just wanted to help troubled youths. Far from helping troubled youth, overnight, Latanya transforms into one. In Jersey City, New Jersey, journalist Daniel Reyes has covered many murderers. But 19-year-old Latanya Bellamy does not fit the mold. This was completely out of left field. She's a normal, normal girl, college girl, home from spring break. Things just got out of hand. On April 4, 2010, Latanya is catching up with her cousin Shaquan Bellamy 
and their lifelong friend, Darmelia Lawrence. Shaquan is the troublemaker of the group, on parole for drug violations and under suspicion of murder. Sometimes an individual will do something completely outside of their nature if they're in a group. A group has power. She just wanted to shoot a gun, but she didn't want to hurt anybody. Shaquan earlier had brought out his guns, the shotgun and the pistol. And then it went to the next stage where it's, let's go out and rob someone. Firing a gun is one thing. You can go to a shooting range and fire a gun. Killing someone is a completely different thing. She could have said, no, maybe lie, say I'm tired, say I might really want to do that, or I'm going to go home. But she went with them. Nia Hawk and her fiance, Michael Muchioki, have just arrived home from a family celebration, their engagement party. They were great people. They had great careers. They loved each other. They were inseparable. They were ready to start a future together. Came home to Jersey City, parked the car to you know, bring all the gifts inside. And that's when the three approached them. Wrong place, wrong time. The couple offers no resistance, give up their car keys without question. But Shaquan orders them to lie face down on the ground. I can't even imagine how terrifying that was. Shaquan then shot Michael in the back of the head with the shotgun. And Latanya's wish to fire a gun comes true. Latanya shot Nia once in the thigh, and then once in the back of the head. In that instant, Latanya is transformed. She trades her entire future for the momentary thrill of being a killer. You go from this, this nice girl who wants to be a social worker, and all of a sudden, she's some kind of monster. It was a thrill kill, did it for adrenaline. That's shocking. I mean, the whole thing is just, it blows my mind. As the saying goes, those who follow the crowd usually get lost in it. Latanya is easily influenced, and she sought approval from the wrong people. I believe, but for the company she was keeping, Latanya never would have hurt anyone. She did something completely outside of her nature, and she's going to pay for it with 93 years in prison. In 2013, she's convicted of two counts of felony murder plus carjacking and sentenced to life plus 30 years. I can't say any of these three people are natural-born killers. Outside influences transformed them made them capable of murder. Many criminologists believe, given the right circumstances, it could happen to any of us. If you see someone fundamentally changing and fail to see the cause, before you know it, you may have a transformer on your hands. And believe me, they are bad news. 